advanced maths module that's now called um, computational analytical methods. Um, we made a few changes to that module about three years ago um, to introduce you looking at the use of software, different software in the mathematical analysis in engineering. So yeah, there's some hand maths element to it, but also going to be looking at software use. So builds on the maths from year one that you did last year, which you didn't do with me, Donald Mark, Mr. Jack, Mr. Jackson, um, and introduces the use of software in engineering analysis. Right, so um, four learning outcomes. Number one, apply further integration techniques and use mathematical methods to evaluate functions. Number two, form and solve first order ordinary differential equations and second order ordinary differential equations. Evaluate the use of 2D and or 3D software methods to generate models and solutions to engineering components and investigate the use of 3D CAD modeling techniques to evaluate models for design performance. So, the assessment of the module has two parts to it. Number one, it has an examination in end of May, June time. Can't remember what the date is, but it has been communicated. That covers learning outcomes one and two, and is of two hours duration. Then there's what's loosely termed a portfolio, but I give you one assignment with three tasks in it, as it currently sits. Um, and the group I'm teaching all year, so I started within semester one, they're going through to the same time as you, they've just handed that in. Okay, so that's kind of the the first half of the module, if you like. And that covers learning outcomes three and four. And it, it includes some of the integration techniques that we'll be looking at and the differentiation techniques we've been looking at that involve what's called numerical methods. They're somewhat time consuming and I wouldn't want to put them in the exam because you wouldn't have time to do them properly. So we do that part in the assignment and then the exam is around the other topics where we can write kind of questions that can be done in 20, 20 25 minutes. Okay. So, so that's the way, that's the module, and that's the way it's going to be assessed. In your notes, if you haven't already had a look, there's a little drill on the first couple of pages around the topic um, that we're going to start with. And I want, what I'm going to do to start with spend this week and next week, we've got two weeks before we have um, a half term break for a week, doing um, a swift revision of differential and integral calculus. We're going to look this morning at the process of differentiation and then this afternoon we'll be looking at some kind of en engineering uses of differentiation to extend that and then next week we'll be doing the same with integral calculus. We'll look at how, how we do it, the techniques involved, and then in the afternoon session, some you, how we might use integral calculus in engineering to solve a problem. Okay, so that's, that's where we're going. So I'll give you, um, as, a, as a graph represents a function, and some questions about that. And there's a little drill on some algebra and really what is the laws of indices. So I'll give another five minutes for you to have a go at those and then we'll run through them because that's kind of testing what we're going to be looking at during the session in terms of the problems we're going to go through. Okay? Right, we'll put you all out of your misery. Should we just see how much you can remember from first year maths? Right. The, the graph of a function there with two points marked on it, A and B, and this, the function is 3x cubed plus 0.2x squared minus 5x plus 6. So it's a cubic equation um, in a typical cubic shape. The two points A and B, how would you define them? What would you say they are? 
Anyone got any ideas? Cannon points is a good one, yeah. We'll be coming back to turn and points um, this afternoon, identifying them. Yeah. So they are turn and points, but specifically, what are they? You could be a bit more specific than that. Yeah, more specifically, they are local maximum. That's A. And local minimum B. And the maximum and minimum would be okay, but the local qualifies that for some functions, not, not a cubic, but some other functions, there could be other maximum and minimum outside the range of what you've plotted. Yeah. So the, the, you, we plotted that perhaps because that's the area or they're the values of x we're interested in. But there could be other places where there's maximum and minimum in some functions. Okay. Two. What's the value of the slope of the graph at points A and B? If we determine the slope at point A. What is the slope of a curve at any point? Remember the slope being a tangent at a point? We draw a tangent at a point. What a tangent means is away from that point as a right angle. So at a maximum or minimum, the tangent is a straight line. The slope is zero. So at a maximum or minimum, the slope of a curve is equal to zero. So that will be what we use to, to identify local maximum and minimum, is find where the slope is equal to zero. And differentiation is all about finding the slope of a function. So we'll come back to that later. Three, indicate on the graph a point where the slope is positive and another where the slope is negative. So a positive slope, where would I find one? Sorry? Going up to A, yeah. So a positive slope, I'll do that in black, would be anywhere there. We get... So if we pick the point there, we've got a slope. Y is getting bigger as X gets bigger. That's what it's about. Yeah. There's another place where we can have a positive slope, and that's anywhere from B upwards in the area we're looking at. A point there, for instance, of a positive slope. Okay, what about a negative slope? between the points A and B. So we're looking at a negative slope anywhere in that area there between those points. Yeah. So that's another important point about finding the maximum and minimum and whether or finding the turning point. Finding the slope is equal to zero will tell you you've got a turning point. Look on either side to see whether the slope changes from positive to negative or negative to positive will identify the nature of that turn and point. Okay? So again, we'll come back to that later. How do we represent the slope of the graph in mathematical notation? So what's the mathematical notation for the slope of a, of a function f x y equals f of x if you like how would I write that how do you write the differential of that 
dy by dx. Yeah. That's how you write it. That's the notation of the slope. That's the function that will give you the slope at any point, any value of x. Right, do you remember that? Another, another notation thing you're going to come across is we'll call the first differential that f dash x. There's another shorthand way under certain circumstances to, to signify the differential. And then when you do that, you can have the second differential f double dash x and so on. And again, we'll pop back to that notation again later on. And then the last question on this page was indicate the point that represents the root of the function. So where's the root? What do we mean by the root? What's it, what does it mean to find the roots of a quadratic equation? Standard form of a quadratic y I'm oh sorry we do something like this x squared plus 3x plus 2 equals zero. If we want to find the roots, we usually write it out like that. Why? Got it. It's the value of the roots are the value of x when y, if you're using x and y as your two your dependent and independent variables, the value of the independent variable when x is equal to sorry, the, the value of the independent variable when the dependent variable is equal to zero. So when y is equal to zero. So you're looking, when you're looking to find the roots, you're looking to find the point where you cross the x-axis. Point or points. Okay? Second page, which is a little bit about the around the algebra manipulation that we need to um, have and use for what we're doing here. What does x to the one equal? X. Yeah. Anything to the power of one is equal to itself. Yeah. But it's useful to remember that if you've got a number in, your, in an equation or a variable on its, on its own, you can write it as x to the 1 or y to the 1 or z to the 1, whatever that is. It's useful to be able to, to remember that you can do that all right, when you're differentiating and integrating. Square root of 9. Three. X to the power zero. Yeah, any number to the power of zero is one. Another useful tool to remember that you can write one as being equal to x to the zero. Okay. Or any other variable to the power of zero you want to give it. The cubed root of 27 is also 3. Yeah. How do we write that in non-fraction form? What could I put beside this 3, just write that a bit bigger, so that it still equals 3? What could I put with... I need an X with it. I want to make... I want to multiply that by a X to the power of something. And that will still equal 3 in total. 
x to the 0. If I write that as 3x to the 0, right? Then, laws of ind think about the laws of indices regarding division. I've got x, forget the 3 for a minute, the 3 is on its own. x to the 0 divided by x to the 3. Sure? Divide, you take them away. So what that is equal to is, we can write that as 3x to the 0 minus 3. Yeah? None. 3. 3x to the 0, so it's equal to 3x to the minus 3. And if we were going to differentiate something like that, we need to get it into that form, the non-fraction form, so that we can, we've, we've got a function and a table that looks like it. Can anyone remember another way to write the square root of x so it's in indices form? Um, anyone remember another way to write square root of x in indices form? x to the half. Correct. Right? And if you can remember that one, it tells you for one like this, where the 2 goes and where the 3 goes in a fraction. Because that is, the denominator is the value of the root, the degree of the root. The numerator is the indices of the variable inside. So that's going to be x to the power of 2 over 3. So remembering the square root 1 gives you that hook into what any other one is, nth power of a number to the power of another index. Okay? And again, if you want to differentiate a function that's got that in it, you're going to need to put it in that form. Okay? So that's a little bit of a, by way of introduction, of some of the techniques we're going to need to do this differential calculus. On the next page, what you've got is a table of standard derivatives. So this is the Bible, really, of the differentiation that we're going to do in this module. In the exam, you will have that table. It's standard table of derivatives, or the shortened standard table of derivatives. It's annoying me at the moment, that noise. But anyway, um, what we're looking with any function is to get into one of these forms so that we can then differentiate by what's indicated on the right. So we'll come, be coming back to that a lot. It might well be worthwhile you producing some kind of table or copying that and putting it right in the front of your folders laminated or something so you've always got table derivatives, the formula you are going to look at later and the integral stuff we look at next week in one place and handy for when you're doing your integration and differentiation. Okay? So I, I recommend that but it's better that you put it in the form that you like it than it is me put it in a form that you don't want. Okay, that, that's what it is, and I do keep repeating it as we go through the notes anyway. Right, so, if we look at that table, the first thing we're going to look at is how do we use this form to find the derivative of functions in the form of a times x to the power of n. Yep. So, that are, that are the first examples we're going to look at. And the first one, it says find the differential coefficient. What that means is find dy by dx for these functions. So, number one, or a, we've got 12x to the power of 3. Okay? And in the table, where y is equal to ax to the n...
dy by dx is equal to, go back to the table, a times n times x to the n minus 1. So we multiply by the index and take 1 off the index. You see that? So what we do with this is we write 12, we multiply by the current index, 3, so that 3 minus 2. I'm going to write it out every step to start with so we understand where we're going. So we've multiplied the 12 by the current index, and then written x, and then we're going to take 3 minus 2, 3 minus 1, right? right. Equals. 3 twelves are 36, x to the power of 2. And I should have put dy by dx equals at the start of that. Yeah. So that's how we do it. The easier is that at this stage. Okay. So that's that one. Right. The second one is an example of one that we need to manipulate first. Y is equal to 12 over x cubed. Yeah. What we need to do to that is ask the question bring the x cube term up to the top if we do that we've got to make it negative yeah got this. so we've got to say that's equal to 12 x to the power of minus 3 yeah so we've got to do that first then we can differentiate so we can go dy by dx is equal to minus 3 times 12, x to the minus 3 minus 1. Minus 3 times 12 is minus 36 x to the minus 4. And then if necessary, if we really wanted to, we could put it back into its original form of minus 36 over x to the 4. But uh, it, in, in an exam question like that, if you got an exam question like that, either that or that would be the right answer and you'd get all the marks. Okay? Unless it's specifically asked for, the answer to be in its original fractional form, either answer would do. Everybody okay with that so far? How to do ax to the n in that instance? If I remember rightly, the next slide, we're going to look at a couple of special cases using ax to the n. Differentiate y equals 6. So, don't, without going back to the table, a, y is equal to 6. How could I write that so I've got x in it and it's still equal to 6? Yeah, we could write that as y is equal to 6x to the 0. Yeah? If we then apply the ax to the n rule that we've been using. So let's write this down. dy by dx is equal to 0 times 6 times x to the 0 minus 1. Yeah. 
None times six is none, and none times x to the minus one is nothing times any number is So if there's a constant we're differentiating, it disappears. It becomes zero. And if you think about it, if we draw a graph of y is equal to 6, for any value of x, y is equal to 6. It's a straight line from left to right. And the slope is equal to zero. So in functions where you've got a constant, when you differentiate, constants disappear. Okay? And the second example, applying to y is equal to 6x. How could I write that and it still be 6x? What index can I apply to x here so that it is still 6x? Yep, x to the 1. We don't normally write the 1 in, but it's there. So, when we differentiate that, dy by dx is equal to 1 times 6 to the 1 minus 1. That's equal to 6x to the O, and x to the, x to the O is equal to what, Charlie? Careful. Any number to the power of none is 1. Yep. So where you've got a constant times your variable, like 6x, 12x, the variable disappears, and you get a constant when you differentiate. A constant slope means our function is what in nature? <laughs> y, x, slope is constant. I get what kind of graph? Straight line. Well done. Okay. So if we if we differentiate a linear function, a straight line, we end up with a constant. And that, those, that example proves that. So we've proven that constants disappear, and a constant multiple of our variable, or a linear function, becomes a straight line. And we differentiate. Okay, everyone happy with those two specific special examples? And if you look in your table again, I know I haven't included them. Some, some tables include the fact that a constant, when differentiated, is equal to zero. But you'll soon get used to it, but when you see 6x, all that gets left behind is the 6, and so on. Very much, the techniques here is practice. The algebra is practice. You're gonna, you, you'll need to find some time away from these classes to practice and do the extra examples that I put in the notes if you're going to do really well in the exam at the end. Okay. So, a bigger problem. Differentiate that function. It's got four terms in it. Okay. What we do in that case is we can split it up. They're all added together. So we've got y is equal to 5x to the 4 plus 4x minus 1 over 2x squared plus 1 over square root of x minus 3. If you've got 
a function that is a sum of various terms of x there. The differential is that we differentiate each of these separately, okay, being very careful with the signs. That's the key to getting this right. And there's a couple of terms there we need to do something with. So, 5x five, five to the 4 is okay. We're able to differentiate that. We're okay with 4x. What do we need to do with 1 over 2x squared? What do I do when I've got the x term as, as the denominator fraction? So I'll do that. Bring it to the top. Change the sign. Yeah, remember we did that? All right. And then we've got this square root term. How can I deal with that? Yeah, 1 times x to the... That's a half underneath. What is it on top? Minus a half. Yeah, minus 3. Okay, Take it. you're going to go through this one on a step-by-step, -step, these examples, and then you're going to have a go yourselves, all right? So, first term, dy by dx is equal to, now I'll tell you what, have a go at that, five minutes, using ax to the n from the table, Differentiate each of those carefully. Be careful with the signs of numbers and see if you can come up with the full differential for that. Right, guys, what we got here? <coughs> how, how do we write this out? Going to write it out in full hand. So it's going to be 4 times 5, x to the 3, or I'll put 4 minus 1, yeah, let's be, we'll soon get away from needing to do that, I think, and then plus what do we know 4x becomes, without really writing out longhand, 4, okay, now, here's a tip, be careful about writing the minus sign in there now. That sign goes with that half in terms of what we're doing now. So we've got minus 2 times minus a half. What do that equal? Yeah, plus 1, doesn't it? Yeah? Alright, so... Best to do, look at it and do that bit first. It's plus 1 times x to the minus 2 minus 1. Yeah? And then minus a half times the 1 that's in there. So it's minus a half x to the minus a half minus 1. And then what happens to the constant on the end? It disappears. Yeah. So writing all of that out, 4 fives are 20, x to the 3, plus 4, plus x to the minus 3, minus half x to the minus... 3 over 2. Yeah. 
That is a correct answer. You could write it as 20 x to the 3 plus 4 plus x to the minus 3 minus a half of the square root of x to the minus 3. But I'm, if, I'm, if I'm absolutely honest, probably prefer it in that form anyway. I don't see any reason why that wouldn't be the correct answer in an exam question. Okay? Uh, no, you just drop it. So that's how you do one, where you've got a number of terms that are added together or subtracted from each other in terms of ax to the n. Okay? Not multiply, not divide. We'll come to them in a little while. I need some formulae for that. All right? So, on the next page, there are some problems involving... Um, cosine and sine functions. So we need to go back to the table for that. Just going to quick. Th these aren't again particularly difficult. We got y is equal to three sine four x, and in the table, dy by dx for a function in this in this form is i cos ax. Yep. So we look at that function. i in this case is the 4. It's inside the sine function. So dy by dx is equal to 4 times 3 times the sine, uh, col, cos of 4x equals 12 cos 4x. Yep. And then the co for the cosine function, very similar. B y is equal to 2 cos 3t, but this time dy by dx is equal to minus a sine ax. So going from cosine to sine changes the function from positive in front to negative in front. So a in this case is the 3 inside there. So dy by dx is equal to minus 3 times 2 sine 3x equals minus 6 sine 3x. Okay? Everyone happy with that? And if there isn't an A, if there's no constant in front of the X term there, it's actually 1. So that would, so if the 3 weren't there, it would be minus 1 times 2. So it changes the sign. What I'm saying, Kieran, you're looking puzzled. Oh, I've written, oh, sorry. I've stymied my own self. dy by dt. T. That's what I get for putting an example in with a different um, independent variable letter, isn't it? dt, dt. That should be t. dy by dt. That's t. And that's t in there. Well spotted, Kieran. All right. 
So sine and cosine functions aren't particularly difficult. And if you've got a x to the power 3 term plus a sine or cosine term, you just deal with each of them separately and add them together like we did in the previous example. The last couple, are, or last three, are examples of some of the other things in the table. So we got y is equal to 3e to the 5x. When we got e to the power of ix, dy by dx in the table is equal to i times e to the ix. Yeah. If you differentiate e to the x, the differential is e to the x. It doesn't. It, it, it's, it's a special function. That's why e to the power of a special, because you differentiate it, you end up with the same function. So what we're doing here is a is the 5 in front of the x there. That's a in this case. So we need to do y by dx is equal to 5 times 3 times e to the 5x equals 15e to the 5x. Everybody follow that? Yeah. Different independent variable, Kieran, eh? B. F. Theta is equal to 2 over e to the 3 theta. What do I need to do to that to get it in a form that we can differentiate? Because it, sorry? Bring the e to the, bring it up, yes, yeah, so we'll make it equal to 2e to the power of minus 3 theta. <laughs> yep. Now we can differentiate it, can't we? Perhaps I ought to put, use the right notation here. F dash, as I used F there, theta is equal to, we've got to bring the minus 3 down and multiply, e to the minus 3 theta, that's equal to minus 6 e to the minus 3 theta. And we, if we want to, we can bring that e to the power down again and make it positive, but that's a good enough answer for me in any exam question. Okay? C. Y is equal to 6 ln 2x. The entry in, in the table for the ln function, for ln ax, dy by dx equals 1 over x, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so dy by dx here is whose 
Nothing to do with I. We don't bring I out and multiply or anything else. We've got ln of a multiple of x. Doesn't make any difference. So what this is is 6 times 1 over x equals 6 over x. Happy with that or not? Yeah, the two, the two just gone. Okay, and it will become apparent. I got asked a question in one of the other groups, the first year group. Once we start doing integration, how does that two, two come back? It does come back, but it comes back as a log of a number that is still a constant. So more about that next week. But that's what happens. The two just goes. Okay. I'll record now. It don't make much difference. All right. So going to look at using the product rule, where two functions are multiplied by each other. I do the first one, and I'll get you to do the second one. All right. So what we've got here, if we look at this um, separately, is we've got 3x squared multiplied by the sine of 2x. That's a function, and that's a function. And our y is equal to that. So they are two functions multiplied by each other. So we're going to use the product rule. Okay. What we do is we say, and that's useful for these ones, to consider at this stage the page split in half. And we go, let u equals 3x squared. And we go, let v equals sine 2x. And then we differentiate those two functions. So we go the u by dx is equal to 2 times 3 is 6 x, 6, x to the 1. Then we differentiate this so dv by dx is equal to 2 cos 2x. Then, it's simply, I like saying that word about maths, it's all simple. Plug those parts into that formula up the top there and simplify. So we start here. dy by dx is equal to, I'm not going to write the formula out, u. So we write whatever we called u, 3x squared. I find it useful to put each term in brackets at this stage. And then you make it easier to see what you've got to do when you simplify. 3x squared, u. Multiply that by dv by dx. So we multiply that by 2 cos 2x. Plus whatever we call v. Sine 2x. Multiplied by du by dx. 6x. And then we can simplify that by bringing any terms together that we can. 3x squared times 2, 6x squared, cos 2x, plus 
six x sine two x. That's the answer. Right. The second problem on the page says determine the rate of change of voltage given V is equal to 5T sine 2T volts. So there's your function. Okay, find the rate of change when T is equal to zero. So all that problem, the only extra bit that problem requires you to do First of all, it requires you to differentiate to dV by dt using the product rule. And then, when you've got your um, rate of change or slope, make t equal to zero, 0.2 in that function and evaluate it. So have a go. See if you can, five minutes, differentiate that function v is equal to 5 sine t. 5t, sorry, sine 2t, differentiate that using the product rule. Set u equal to 5t, so its differential is 5. Set uh, v is equal to 2 sine t. dV by dt is 2 cos t. Plug all those numbers in the formula there. And then simplify at the end. And then the last bit was to replace. So we go when t is equal to 0 0.2 seconds. dV by dt. The rate of change of voltage with time is equal to 10 times 0 0.2 cos 2 times 0 0.2 plus 5 sine 2 times 0 0.2. And the answer for that was, you plug it all in the calculator with your calculator in radians mode, 3.7 Nine two to five significant figures. Yeah. Okay. Right. What we'll do, I think, is we'll leave the quotient rule and the function of a function rule till this afternoon. On the next page, there's a couple of examples for you to finish off by having a go at, okay? And in traditional John Bird's book form, the answer you should get is on the right-hand side. So what you just got to do is show that you see how you can get to that by using the product rule.